Let's get to the reason that we're all here tonight. Mr. Marty Kagan. Marty is, as you all know, founder and partner at Silicon Valley Product Group. Before that, you might know he was a leader at eBay and at Netscape and started his, you know, earlier in his career at Hewlett Packard. You know, it's fun. I had to update the slide to add a third book, right? How many people have three so popular, amazing books? And actually, I counted as four because he basically rewrote Inspired. So it's four so far, really. He's here to share advice from his new exciting book that you all have in your hands, Transformed, on moving to the product operating model. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Marty Kagan. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And I... We had no idea there would be so many and that would, you know, you had to wait in line a long time. Probably not a great experience for you. It was kind of fun for me to have a chance to <laughs> talk to each person and see, um, you know, see who's here and I'm supposed to stand in a box. So I'm making sure. So, um, and there were a few people that didn't get their book signed yet. I will stick around. So please, um, we'll do that at the end. And anyway, um, you know, one of the advantages to people coming up and spending a second chatting is um, a number of people said they had some questions, especially because I, pro I made the ill-advised decision to speak on Lenny's podcast again. <laughs> and um, uh, we, there were some big things that we wanted to talk about that honestly really are, are not even really about the book. They were about industry trends some of the macro things happening in our world, because a lot of product people are pretty anxious right now. Um, and, you know, he wanted to talk about that. And I think, you know, I told him that is legitimate. We should talk about that. I knew it's not really a smart thing to talk about because uh, it's not really stuff people want to hear. But, um, you know, and Lenny knows this, we've been friends for a long time. Uh, I'm kind of at that stage in my career. If I make people unhappy with me, but I still feel like I'm helping them, I, I'm going to do that trade. So I don't have to worry about whatever. There aren't that many next years coming. So let's, <laughs> we're going to um, take care of uh, as much as I can. You know, I really want to see people do well. And, you know, one of the things that really bothers me, and I think this is relevant, but one of the things that really bothers me is so many people tell me why they became a product manager but what they're living every day is so different. And they're frustrated. Um, they're frustrated with how the role is done in their company. They're like, I didn't sign up for this. And they want to experience the good stuff that some of us have been lucky enough to have. In fact, a lot of those people have worked in places like that before. So that's, that's frustrating. And I wanted to, um, you know, really want to talk about that. And, we, that isn't the talk I have planned, but I won't, I know it's on a lot of people's minds, at least from what people said. And so I want to make sure we have plenty of time for that. In fact, it'd be fine with me if that's all we talked about, if that's what you wanted to do. But um, I thought since there is a new book, and I mean, it's not unrelated because the whole subject of this book is you don't have to work that way. You don't have to be in a feature team. I will tell you the reason this was not in the grand plan to write this book. Uh, the grand plan was, you know, inspired for product teams, empowered for product leaders. Everything's great. As soon as we did inspired, the first thing people came back with was, I don't think it's possible to work this way. I mean, no, outside of Silicon Valley, for sure. You're in some company. And they're like, you have no idea what our company is like. And they're like, this is just impossible to get from here to there. And of course, I've been hearing that objection, by the way, for 20 years. And we have a long list of companies that have actually changed that way. And so I'm like, OK, we're going to write this book to answer that once and for all. And so for those that don't know, in addition to um, you know, talking what we'll talk about here, there's full of examples of companies. And we had a rule for ourselves, not a single example from Silicon Valley. Because that's too easy, right? I mean, if you're born in the product model, it's a lot easier. But if you're a big, like one of my favorite companies is from uh, Saudi Arabia. Not known as a tech hub, but did amazing level of innovation. Um, there's companies in healthcare, uh, regulated industries, uh, sales-driven, SaaS. All these companies transformed 
to really do impressive things. And one of the things we wanted to do, so there are really a, a, some big goals in this book. The first is to convince people, yes, it is possible for you to change. Stop saying it's not possible. You know, you may not want to do it, that's fine, but you, you could absolutely change. And then the part that gets me excited is, okay, okay, go through all this work and you change. So what can you do now that you couldn't do before? Because that's really the ultimate quest test of whether transformation was anything worth doing. Is can Because the point is, can you actually uh, take advantage of opportunities and respond to threats that you couldn't before? That's why we transform. So my favorite part of the book is actually all the stories of what those companies, after they transformed, what they were able to do. And honestly, I mean, you'll judge for yourself. That's the thing about a book. You, you read it. I would argue that many of those stories will stack up against the best companies in Silicon Valley. And that's, that's inspiring to me, inspiring. When you see people that didn't have all the advantages we have right here, but they were able to put oh, themselves exactly. together and start working this way, and no excuse. So I, I just want people to realize that it is possible <laughs> to change. Um, and I also want, and this is the part that kind of got a lot of people a little concerned on the Lenny interview, was um, a lot of people just don't believe they have the ability to influence their company. This is referred to, of course, you may know as sense of agency. Do you believe you can make your career better, your company better? And uh, I believe it absolutely, because I've seen it so many times. Now, can an individual contributor convince the CEO of a big company to change? Probably not. Probably never even meet that person. But can they actually raise their game? For example, to go from a product owner to a real product manager? And will the rest of the stakeholders, the rest of the team, the other the leaders, will they recognize that? Probably. Will they appreciate it? Often. Sometimes they're actually even promoted. To, because this is like, now you've got somebody who actually understands the data, understands the customers, understands the business. That's not, that's not what they're used to. So the point is, people have a lot more ability to impact the quality of their life in, at work than they realize. Product leaders have way more than they realize. Um, that's often a source of real frustration for CEOs because the product leaders complain that the CEOs don't get it. The CEOs complain that the product leaders aren't doing it. So like, come on, you need to show that you have um, earned that trust. So these are the kinds of things I was sharing with Lenny, which you can imagine some people are like, you know, uh, well, that's, that's sort of personal, aiming at their sense of, uh, you know, sense of agency is a weird one because it kind of gets to whether people think they deserve, you know, to be able to influence their, their company and stuff. And I think they do. And so the book, of course, is meant to be, and is how do you do that? How do you change at the team level or at the individual level, at the team level, at the product leader level, at the organizational level? So in that sense, this book is different than all the others. All the other ones are, are the techniques and principles of how you do good product. This is more like, how do you change? So in that sense, it's pretty hard. Changing a company, hard. You know that. Uh, and we're not talking superficial changes. Even like so many companies move to agile, but comparatively speaking, that's pretty superficial. All right. So... Um, let me just give you, uh, I'm gonna go quick through this. I know Dan, we're, I had, Dan explained why with the Zoom and everything, we're gonna do questions at the end. But if I do, if you wanna stop me on something, I'll repeat the question, but uh, we'll try to do most of the questions at the end. But I wanna um, go kind of quick through this so that we can get to your questions. Um, that's, that's probably the most useful thing. So let me uh, talk very quickly. When we talk about this term product operating model, we didn't invent the term, but I needed a term. I can tell you that we didn't want um, to use the term product driven company or product led company or product centric company. Those are kind of the terms people use, but what does that really sound like to most of the company? Product management's gonna take over. 
And that's not the message we are at all trying to give. So um, there were um, some of the companies we work with uh, use the term product operating model or product model for short. And we didn't want to coin a new term. That's, that's a difficult thing. So we just adopted that. But why do we like it? First of all, um, the product model this product model is all about achieving outcomes. In fact, at a, at a high level, it's about going from output to outcomes. That's really at the highest level. Um, but it is not a process. Now, that's super important because every one of the best companies we know has their own you know, culture, they've got their own frameworks, they've got their own methods, but the principles are consistent. And one of the reasons we like the idea of a, con a product model is it's a conceptual model. It's a conceptual model. It, you can have lots of different instantiations of a conceptual model, but the concepts are what's important. The principles are what's important. In fact, this set of product first principles, the first half of the book is basically defining those product first principles, which are what we find in the best companies. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I have privilege of knowing uh, the founder of this company into it who were given us Scott Cook, who was a, one of the earliest strong product managers. And, um, and by the way, Bill Campbell, who was a legend, was a CEO here actually for a while and a board member for a long time and coach for a long time of Scott. And um, yeah, product first principles have been around. And that, I think that's the most important thing. Well, we'll talk about them, but you know, there are things like embracing experimentation. If, you, know, you can do that lots of different ways. Tools have never been better. It's different with hardware than software. There's differences in B2B with consumer, all that. But if you don't embrace experimentation, you're not going to be innovating. Full stop. So that's an example of a principle that you find consistently used in the best companies and nowhere to be found in most of them. Uh, so I do want to emphasize that there is no one right way to create products. Just like there's no one wrong way. There's a lot of wrong ways. There's a lot of right ways. The, uh, the, what really matters are those principles. Okay. Yeah. And one of the things that's funny is we've been talking about this lots of different ways over the years. For a long time, I just literally did not want to name the destination because I just hate, it's just very, uh, I think there's also a lot of arrogance when you say, oh, I'm going to name it this, you know, whatever. Most people probably not going to pay attention to you. What I wanted to do is, uh, I, so we, the way we just referred to it is, well, look, there's how the best companies work and there's how the rest work. And we're all about sharing the practices of the best. And that's true still, but I think it's pretty vague, right? Just do you want to work like the, the best? We also would say, and you, many of you recognize this because this nomenclature is used a lot moving from projects to products. This is a whole project infrastructure, the way you fund, the way you staff, the way you build, everything. And so that's uh, the, another way to framing this. One of the ones I use a lot with CFOs and CEOs is, because they really relate to this, moving from time to market, which they love, but to point out, is that really what you care about or is time to money what you care about? And that's another way of saying basically outcomes over output. Yeah. And I'm mentioning these because depending on your leaders, you want to pick something that you think will really resonate. Uh, this is another popular, well, popular is hard to describe. It is, uh, is commonly referenced um, to move from feature teams, order takers, to empowered product teams, problem solvers. That's another way this is described. Of course, the main one, and the language that we use the most is moving from output to outcomes. And you know, I, I, I think that's a good, you know, it's a few word summary of what all of this is about. The thing is, it's so much easier said than done, right? Because that is hard. Moving, it's not that hard to do output. I was taught, you know, Waterfall is all about optimizing for output. It is not that hard to hit a date. We cut functionality, we cut quality, we cut documentation, we cut all this stuff to hit a date. We know how to do that. Solving a problem, meeting a business goal, that's much harder. And so it almost makes it sound a little too easy, so, but that is the, if you had to pick a single tagline, that's what we've been going with lately. 
All right, so what do we really even mean by a product model? This is uh, what I kind of wanted to double click on. Um, you know, it is, we're talking 200 of the 400 pages of the book here, so there's a lot to talk about. But at the highest level, we're going to talk about three dimensions uh, of, um, of the product model. And then we'll also talk about the uh, five critical concepts and the four new key competencies. Those are, that's the foundation. And of course, what really the heart of it is the 20 product principles underlying all this. So let's start with um, the product dimensions. You know, there's, there's any number of ways you could talk about how a good company works. And I, you know what, I'm talking about Amazon, I'm talking about uh, Netflix, I'm talking about Stripe and, and Google. And uh, there's, um, you know, Spotify, by the way, is another good one in Europe. And companies that really do live these principles, but they all do it in a different way. Apple is another one. I mean, that's what we're talking about. We could talk about think, or how you frame that different ways. What we think is most useful is to frame it in terms of these three questions. How do you decide what to work on? Basically, how do you decide? That's product planning. Every company does some form of that every year or every quarter. But how do you decide what problems are you going to solve? That's the work you're going to do. And then once you've decided you want to work on some problems, how do you solve those problems? That's the second big dimension. And the third is, OK, once you've solved that problem, how do you get that, pro how, how do you get that solution to your customers? Those are the ways we think is most useful at the highest level. Let me double click on that. The first one, how do you decide which problems to solve? I would argue this is actually the highest ROI, the highest impact thing you could do. Because ultimately, most companies, their success will boil down to whether they pick the right things to work on. And you know, that's uh, everybody know, here probably knows it boils down to a lot of focus. And that seems to be like the hardest thing for so many companies to do. But, um, but this is important. How do you decide what to do? It's also worth pointing out that most companies that are not working in the product model, they don't even try. I mean, I mean this, I, I'm not being sarcastic. When I say they don't even try, they basically allocate resources to stakeholders. And so each stakeholder has their basically roadmap of stuff. That's not deciding this. That's letting, that's basically just delegating that to each stakeholder. And they're all the teams, the feature teams are just trying to help run the business. Not saying any of that is useless. I'm just saying that is not looking holistically at what are the most important opportunities and what are the most serious threats. That's the difference is moving to that way of working. In the product world, we refer to that as real product strategy. That is what the product leaders do. I would argue that two big things that good product leaders do for their companies, number one, first and foremost, is they develop their people. They coach and develop their people. Because otherwise, if your product teams don't have people that know what they're doing, it all falls apart anyway. But assuming they do that, then the next big thing they do for the company is serious product strategy. And that's, um, that's refer we refer to that as continuous product strategy because yes, it, it's usually every quarter we're updating the product strategy, but the product strategy is getting new inputs constantly, big insights. We learn, a team in discovery learns something, we factor that into the next iteration of the strategy. It's worth pointing out, because this is another common confusion. I mean, I, uh, so many people think that, um, that I throw all this work on a product manager. <laughs> but, and it's really, and I know where that comes from because they're looking at what they're used to doing, which is mostly project management, which as you know, project management will, have, will consume every available hour in a day. So they see all that and they say, oh, but we are throwing all this other stuff, product discovery on top of that and product strategy and product vision, only product discovery. In fact, one of the things you'll see, when you move from feature teams to empowered product teams, you're not adding responsibilities, but you are totally changing the job. And that's why for most companies that are moving to this model, it is a new competency. They might have people with the same title, but it's a totally different job definition. So 
Changing how you decide which problems do you solve? Are you really working on the things that can move the needle for the company? That's the other big responsibility of the product leaders. Second is looking at how do you solve those problems. Um, for most companies, they don't really even try. What they're doing is the stakeholders are giving them the solutions that either come from the sales organization or come from the stakeholder or come from the CEO. Well, or they think this is the feature we need. And of course, they prioritize those features and projects and they call it a roadmap. And they give that to the teams and they work out, you know, a little bit when you think you can get this and stuff like that. And that's basically, and they're not trying to solve problems. I mean, somebody's ultimately trying to solve problems, but the teams are there to implement the features. Roadmaps, unless you do something called outcome based roadmaps, which you might have heard of, but almost nobody does, it's just output. They're just features and projects. And you know, industry statistics, about 20% of those actually solve the problem underneath. That's a pretty bad efficiency rate. So changing how you solve problems means giving teams problems to solve and then giving them the tools to solve them. This is why um, so much of this swirl is going on with the role of product manager because it, you know, the truth is in a feature team from, from the C-suite, they kind of look like an empowered product team. There's somebody with a title product manager. There's usually some kind of designer and there's a set of engineers. So from their point of view, well, it looks like a regular product team squad, whatever you want to call it, but very different. The people on those teams have a you know, different set of skills, mostly the product manager. In a feature team where you're given a prioritized set of features to build, it's very much communication, coordination, delivery. It's a project management job. But if you're trying to give the team a problem to solve, you now need, you, we still need engineers to build, and worry about feasibility. We still need designers to worry about usability and that exists in a feature team. But now, since the product team is responsible for solving that problem, you need another set of skills, which are somebody that really understands customer value and business viability. And that's where the real product manager role came from. And that's uh, what I'm, you know, the, one of the reasons it caused so much swirl, the Lenny interview, was um, forever, for 20 years, I've been saying, look, you know, there's lots of people that talk about how to work in feature teams. That's just not what we do. We just talk about how the best teams work. If you don't want to work that way, that's fine. Do whatever. But if you're interested in that, we are writing books and articles and stuff like that. But now I was saying, well, if you don't switch to like what we're talking about, I'm worried you're genuinely vulnerable because a lot of CEOs are deciding that's really not very helpful. In fact, a lot of designers and engineers are cheering for that. They're saying like, yeah, we could do the project management. Why do we need this person called a product manager taking up space? It's not helpful. And so I, I'm trying to tell people that I am genuinely worried about the role for those teams that are just project managing. And so I'm encouraging people to, to do what we're talking about. And for most individual contributor product managers, that's this. That means learning how to solve problems, which means really getting to know your customers. The biggest one, of course, is to learn your business, all the different dimensions, how it funds, how it monetizes, how you market, how you sell, how, how you ensure compliance, what are the legal considerations. This is what a real product manager does. This is what they bring to the team. The designer doesn't know this. The engineers sure don't know this. If you don't have somebody on the product team that knows this, well, what's, there's really only two choices. One is that every time you have a decision, you, you schedule a stakeholder meeting with 10 stakeholders and let them fight it out. By the way, that happens all the time. And the other is probably, I don't know which is worse, but the other one is uh, they escalate. Everything goes to a manager, says, well, we need a decision on this. 
So I thought, I mean, think about it. Do you really need a product manager for that? Most designers are happy to cover that if they need to. They could do the same thing. And I'd rather have another designer headcount or another engineer headcount. And a lot of CEOs are making that same calculus. So this is what makes me nervous about those teams that are not you know, working this way. Maybe I shouldn't worry about them, but I have a lot of friends that are stuck in companies like that, and I genuinely, when they tell me how, how much they don't like their job, it does bother me. All right, so changing how you solve problems. What does that really mean? Product discovery. That's the term we use for that. That's, and it requires a serious product manager that's done their homework. The part that really confuses me to go from a feature team product manager to an empowered product team product manager, it takes about three months for most people. If they have, first of all, two big ifs, they have to have, that person has to want to learn. Not everybody does. And then they need, more importantly, they need somebody who knows how to do this that can coach them. It's like I had somebody who literally was assigned to help me learn these things. It took three months. And I was... Uh, coming from kind of a worst case scenario, an engineer that really didn't have any financial analytics understanding, no marketing understanding, no go-to-market understanding, never been to customers at the time. You know, all this was new. It doesn't take that long. Now, I did have the advantage of somebody who was excellent to coach me, but today the tools are there if you want to even do it for yourself. That's what I hope, that's what I'm encouraging people to do. At worst, it will make you more valuable to your company at the minimum. <coughs> All right. The third is change in how you build. This doesn't get talked enough, and I, I'm, I'm criticizing myself here. I realize that um, I just haven't been talking about this enough. And the reason, uh, you know, because look, we're on the product side, we focus more on the discovery and we trust our engineers to do delivery. And the engineers are not really the problem, but unfortunately, the agile coaches are. And um, they, uh, they, they call it agile, and they're releasing monthly. That's not agile. I don't care what's going on. Of course, look at how many are releasing quarterly or officially every 10 weeks. Like, that's better. That's just ludicrous. Now, it's important to call out why it's ludicrous. First of all, you can't take care of your customers today. If you cannot respond to issues within really minutes, if not hours, if you have to wait a month or a quarter before you can fix an issue, good luck competing against anybody that knows what they're doing. Good luck. The, bigger issue, the broader issue is, remember this is all about going to outcomes. How in the world do you prove outcomes if you don't have all the instrumentation, if you don't have the telemetry, if you don't have the monitoring, if you don't have the ability to run A-B tests, if the ability to release stuff dark? There's a whole level of deployment infrastructure that was supposed to happen when companies moved to Agile 20 years ago. But that a bunch of, you know, I get in trouble when I say this too, but I'm already in so much trouble, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> Process people, they focus on the process and they miss the point. And so, um, no, we need to make sure that your organization has the infrastructure in place so that we can prove the outcomes. Otherwise, we could talk all we want, but if we're just hand-waving, we have to be able to demonstrate. We need them just to know if it's working right. And if it's not working right, it tells us what's going on so that we can then work on fixing it. So the ability, you know, if you don't have the ability to do small, frequent, reliable, uncoupled releases, good luck being any good. And I, I just can't believe in 2024 I'm saying that still. But, you know, just look in the rest of the world. Look at the people using, hopefully nobody here knows what this even is, but in most of the world they use this absolute garbage called SAFE. <laughs> Which, which it's just pure marketing. It stands for Scaled Agile Framework. It's not agile in any shape or form. But that's what they do. What's really going on there is those companies, those CIOs are prioritizing predictability over innovation. That's what's going on. Because safe is, it's just waterfall. I mean, it's literally waterfall. 
And that's what we do if we want predictability. But if we want innovation, it's the opposite of what we need to do. So those are the way we think about it at a high level. Changing how you decide what to do, that's continuous product strategy. Changing how you solve problems, discovery, and changing how you build, test, deploy, continuous delivery. All right, so let me quickly mention some of the competencies. You really are, I mean, when I say designer, I'm talking a product designer, somebody who knows service design, interaction design, visual design, user research. They have that holistic, great view. You know, the kind of designer we all love to work with. Um, and of course, tech lead, you know, we're talking about engineers that care just as much about what we build as how we build. The tech lead. Um, and the big one that's different there from most companies is what we were talking about, the product manager. Because they have people by all these titles. I, you know, we tell CEOs that you have people with these titles. The problem is they're not doing the job we're talking about. So we need to redefine those jobs. That starts with new job definitions. In many cases, they need training, they need coaching to learn how this is done. But the way it's done in a good product company versus most is very different here. And of course, the fourth one, product leaders, that's also radically different. Think about it, if you are in a feature team organization, your product leaders, they're not, they don't do product strategy, they don't do product vision. Should they be doing coaching? Yes, most of them, not so much. But, uh, but they're not doing what we're talking about. So the product leaders, that's a big competency. And in fact, they are really, when we talk about a transformation, they are the key right there. They are the key. The individuals on the team can do a lot to show what their team can do, but the product leaders are the ones that can change, literally change the course of the company. And those are the ones that are really responsible for winning the hearts and minds of the senior executives. Somebody asked me, because um, this, one of the difficult things in transformation is kind of what comes first. Is it that the teams get all these great skills and show the company what they can do? Or does the CEO get enlightened and say, we're going to work this way? And the truth is, it doesn't really work like that. It's not one or the other. And the way I've sort of been trying this out lately, but the, the metaphor that works that I find is the closest to what it feels like is like when we play a, a multi-level game. And you know, at level one, you've got, you're developing some basic skills, but once you've demonstrated in that game, you have those skills, you get entrance to level two. And once you develop those school skills, you get entrance to level three. That's what it feels like when you're transforming a company. The, 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 you start showing what you can do, and when you've shown you can deliver an outcome, <laughs> you get more rope, you get more ability to do that on a bigger level. Sort of starts in a product team, we call those pilot teams, and then it spreads to a group, if you like Spotify term, tribes, you know, a collection of teams. It goes to a business unit and eventually to a company. So it's, and, and think about it, pretend for a second, try to put yourself in the shoes of the CEO. Should she really trust? that the product organization knows how to do this stuff? Most are not, even if they're hopeful, they're like, well, okay, I'll let you try this. <laughs> and if you show me you can do this for this group or this team, I would love to let you do it for bigger. So I think to me, that's both, that's responsible. That's a CEO being responsible. Even if they're completely supportive, they have to use some judgment here. They're not gonna bet their whole company on something they don't even know if the people can do. So to me, that's, that's what it feels like. It's more like that. Sort of earn your trust at every level. Remember, and I'm really speaking to the product leaders in the room, your job really is to win hearts and minds of your team, so kind of starting there, but especially of the different parts of the company. And we do that sort of one person at a time. Some of you know my partner, uh, Christian. For those that haven't met Christian Idioti, he is literally the most gifted product leader I have ever met. I, I, uh, 
I mean, you just have to see him and listen to him to know what I'm talking about. He is an amazing gifted storyteller, but also, I mean, I have never seen anybody earn trust with senior leaders faster than this person. Uh, I mean, I sound like him. I am chairman of his fanboy association, but um, anyway, that's sort of the ultimate as far as I've seen. I've learned a lot from watching him in action. Okay, the, um, that's the competencies. Then there's several, once you have these people with these skills, what do you do with them? There's really five main things we do with them. Well, let's come back to culture. The product strategy we've talked about, product teams. Of course, that's where products are created in teams. And of course, discovery and delivery are the two main activities that product teams do. Product culture, it's uh, how do you make decisions? What, do you, what is the priority of things like innovation? What's the role of process? These are the principles that speak to product culture. And together, I would argue that sort of captures the product model. The heart of the product model are the product principles. And the product principles are kind of in support of each of these five concepts. And, uh, you know, I could... It's hard to rattle off when there's 20, but for things like um, uh, culture, like one of the quotes we love to share is from Spotify, which is 100% predictability equals 0% innovation. They understand this. Um, and so the point is, what's the priority, innovation or predictability? Uh, predictability is absolutely important, but not as important as actually, you know, making progress on what we need to do, outcome over output, same idea. Um, as far as strategy, this idea of focus, the idea of in, um, insight-driven strategies um, is, is critical, this idea of making bets. I think Dan was talking about that as well. Um, and of course, product teams, they need to be empowered, they need to be accountable. Uh, they need to understand that it's, um, it's all about minimizing waste. Uh, so, and of course, we talk about discovery and delivery all the time. I was mentioning several delivery principles with small, frequent, reliable, uncoupled releases. That's most teams, that's done with continuous deployment. Um, things like instrumentation or telemetry for everything we do. That's a principle. There's no law that says you have to do it, but how are you going to measure outcomes and know what to do if you're not doing that? All right. Strategic context is basically if you're going to push decisions down to the product teams, which is essentially what we're talking about, pushing decisions down, you need to not only coach the people so they know how to do their job and make sure they have the skills, however, but you also need to give them the context to make good decisions. Because this is not, you know, any given product team. If all they know is what they're working on, they don't have the big picture. They need to know the product vision. They need to know the team topology. That's the different structure of the teams and what teams are doing what. And, uh, and absolutely, they need the big picture on the product strategy. And then the objectives are the problems to solve for each team. So that's just trying to help you visualize. This is what a product team needs in order to be empowered and to make good choices. All right. Um, yeah, I won't go through all these, but like I said, my favorite part really about the book is sharing these stories of these companies, none of which are, you know, Intuits or Slack or anything like that. Well, those are the kind of companies we talk about in the other books. These are companies, I mean, th this is the team in Saudi Arabia, you know, Kaiser, one of the largest healthcare. Re in fact, what Kaiser did. The truth is, I, I didn't even, when my partner, Chris Jones, uh, which Dan was just referencing, can we have some people here, right? From, what Kaiser did on that, when Chris first told me, I'm going to confess here something, I didn't believe that they did it because it is so impressive. What uh, is called Get Care Now, and you can read the story, but it is like remarkable what they were able to do. Remarkable. Um, CarMax, uh, the biggest used car sales company in the uh, U.S., they're based in Richmond, Virginia. What they did to not only uh, recover 85% drop in revenue when the pandemic hit, to totally turn that around and come out stronger than ever. Jim Pass, do you know them? Brazil-based company that, uh, again, their innovation was 
amazing. Train Line, probably my, one of my all-time favorites. Train Line is uh, Monday through Friday in the UK. Train Line is more uh, higher rated than Uber in the App Store. Think about that. Train Line is uh, a complete turnaround. It was a private equity. They bought out the company, old e-commerce kind of company, bought it, moved to the product model, and became the UK's number one IPO. And it is just an amazing story. Uh, all these, as you could tell, um, well, The Guardian's a uh, fabulous story as well. Uh, the fact they were, uh, the internet almost took them out. 200-year-old company. I think it's 202 right now. It's amazing. Um, and then, of course, DataSite, which is an enterprise, super heavy sales driven enterprise B2B company. Customers frustrated, people leaving, total turnaround. Uh, and um, to become literally best in class. That's, uh, and like I said, they're actually, DataSite is based in uh, Minneapolis. So none of these are. Um, you know, the Amazons or whatever. And the point is, um, these, each one of these companies would tell you they were able to do things that they never thought they could do before. That's what this is about. All right. So, um, yeah, you, you know the books. Um, and I, I, yeah, the, it transforms out. So I, I hope people uh, give it a read, especially if you are you know, in your heart of hearts, not convinced you can do this stuff. But you, if you want to, because I think hopefully you will be convinced. Um, the, uh, I don't think there's anything really important here I wanted to share. Let's take some live questions and then we'll switch over to some Zoom. Who's got the first question? No pressure. Heather does. Right? Marty, I... Uh, I loved everything you said. Um, this whole project manager, this is the world that I'm in. So do you, on your slide, you didn't say you need a project manager to handle all the day-to-day -day, like things. Do you, do you, as a product manager, do you have to convince your company to hire these types of people or does that get offloaded to engineering or other yeah, suckers? No, great question. Uh, and other ones. <laughs> but it's, suckers, suckers. Oh, I just got that. Oh, no, no, we love our project managers because <laughs> if they weren't there, we would have to do it. <laughs> So, and our program yeah. managers, and our program managers. Well, that's what I was yeah, getting yeah. to. So, the, and this is kind of one of those, almost every company, except for really small startups, almost every company has at least one form of project managers. Delivery managers, project managers, program managers, those are the three major titles. They're all over this valley. I mean, they're all over. And um, so the issue is, can that product manager offload that information or offload that to one of them? And that is absolutely what I coach people to do and have for many years, offload that so that, because you know the job is, and this is what's really striking. Project management is sort of by definition around delivery. Product management is by definition around discovery. So it, it couldn't be more different job. It's not that as a product manager, we don't care about delivery, just like we care about engineering, we care about design, but we don't have to do it. We can hand that to our colleagues. And a lot of that honestly is, you know, because now we're getting into coaching people and the main challenge is let it, getting them to let go of that stuff sometimes. Because it's not that they want to be in all those meetings, it's that they're scared if they're not. And so uh, this sort of is this real, in the, you know, coaching them to trust their colleagues. They've got your cell number. If anything comes up, they can reach you. But fundamentally, you want to offload that. And virtually every company, every once in a while, I mean, it's mostly a company that's small and now is growing. And I'm like, you need some delivery managers. So I'm not saying that's not important. And I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm just saying that's not the core of product management. The truth is, in early stage startups, which I love, by the way, I've done a couple, I love it. In early stage startups, there isn't that much project management. There's just not that many people. <laughs> we all sort of fit in a room. And so it's normal and not a problem if the product manager covers some and the engineering manager covers some. That's normal. But as you grow, boy, that becomes out of hand. Like, uh, uh, I know we have some people here from Apple because they were sharing some of their stories. Apple would not be able to ship anything without their program managers. 
think about how complex their programs are. But you notice how you get a watch all of a sudden or AirPods and all of a sudden all your other devices recognize it. How does that happen? That's program management, like amazing coordination over very complex systems. So it is an important role, managing the dependencies, the interactions, this is a bit important. It's just not product management. And this is the thing, if you're doing that and there's nothing wrong with anybody who wants to do that, this is very necessary role. It's just that I would ask you who in the world is doing the product management, if you're not. And that's sort of the problem. Yes, go ahead. These days there is the role of data, which is emerging similar to the four roles you're talking about, the tech leads, product managers, et cetera. There is the data leadership role, there is the data leads role, things like that. Do you have any opinion on yeah. how well, that fits into no, that? No, absolutely. And you notice, I talked about the four key competencies there, but there are several other roles. I mean, we just talked about one of them, delivery managers, that are necessary. But those aren't new competencies. Those are, those are existing competencies. Data is a little more interesting, because there's two kinds of data roles today. I mean, at a top level, these are both, you all know. There are um, those that help us make decisions with data, Data analysts, typical. That's been around for at least 20 years. Uh, and by the way, I, there's some of my favorite people to have helping teams. Uh, and my favorite definitions of product ops have a lot of these people, they mostly. They're helping you make decisions with data. And then there are those data people that power our products. Right? These are data-powered products. A lot of machine learning-powered products are this way. Um, and those are a class of product. Not every product is data powered, but a lot of them today is. That's a different thing. So that is, that is really, you can think of them as one of the engineers or, or more than one of the engineers on those teams. So they're either supporting multiple teams as data decision, which can be either called data analysts or data scientists sometimes, or product ops, or they're data engineers or data scientists building your product itself for your customers. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's, it's fabulous. Um, in some companies that, is, that are so data intensive, intensive, they will, and I'm not talking about the data engineers. I mean, a lot of the whole, the engineers are very much doing that. But I mean, to make decisions, they'll put a data analyst on each team. But most of them don't. Most of them will have a small number of data analysts that support a broader, broader number of teams. And by the way, very similar discussion around qualitative decision making with user researchers. Because if you have a certain number of teams, it makes a lot of sense to have at least a small number of user researchers helping you make decisions qualitatively. When things get tough in my business, my business partners and I go to YouTube and we put on one of your keynotes. And we watched you recently, 2018, talking about empowered teams, product management skills, product engineering collaboration, discovery. That was a long time ago when you were bringing that up, preaching to the choir here, at least in this case. Uh, I love the... Book, uh, the way you've laid it out here, I'm excited to try to bring that to what we're doing, but like it still seems like the exception and a rarity where there are empowered teams to have the permission to like do the right thing. And um, are, we, are we losing the fight? Are we fighting the right way? Can you talk about how we can drive more of the goodness into the world that we work in. Yeah. Um, by the way, you just summarize endless frustration for me. I mean, look, 20 years I've been trying to get more people to work like the best. And if we look uh, overall, I mean, in an absolute sense, there's way more people working like the best. But in a relative sense, it seems about the same percentage, which is not very good. I mean, it's somewhere, it's hard to know, really, but somewhere like 10 to 20 percent, I would put in that best category, and 80 to 90 in the rest category. I don't think that's very good. One of the things I discussed with Lenny, I probably shouldn't have, was, um, was why the hell is that the case? Just essentially what you're asking. And I have a theory, and it's a difficult one to share. I did share it with him, and, but, and that is that um, 
It's fr very frustrating. What motivated my, this was not, this was more recent than the book. What, if you have been following, I've had a lot of stuff talking about theater, product management theater, transformation theater, product, you know, how is that possible? And I, what, what kicked me, really frustrated me was one of the biggest organizations in the US, at least, that trains product managers, shared an article I won't embarrass them publicly, but you know, it takes two minutes to figure out. And um, it shared an article about how they define the product manager role. And I'm looking at this article and I can't believe they said this out loud. Because they don't, most people, you know, you hear them try to define a product manager, they go to, they bend over backwards to try to make it sound important and try to make it sound more than a project manager. This company did not. It was 100%, you're, you know, communication, coordination, and you should know a little bit about engineering, a little bit about design, <laughs> that's it. And I'm like, I cannot believe they said this out loud. And this is the primary group create, you know, certifying product managers. I'm like, we're screwed if that's what's going on. And like, how does that happen? Well, my theory is if you're a brand new product manager and uh, you join a job and you go, go to Google, you type something like, you know, how do I product manage or something? Uh, chances are you will end up in people teaching you from feature team world or worse. That's just the odds. And by the way, generative AI only increases the likelihood of this not going well. If you think about how uh, predictive text works. Uh, so those, you know, so many people they just get put on this path and they think they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And then their CEO says, I mean, there's one other thing that motivated me was a European CEO told me he had 200 product owners and he said, the truth is, I think if we got rid of all 200, nobody would care. That hurts, right? I mean, that's harsh. But, you know, I could, how could I disagree with them? Product owners, have you met, you know, this is thankfully not much of an issue here. I hope none of you have a title on your LinkedIn profile, product owner. If you do, you should wake up and fix that, like, right away. Um, that is not a job. That's a role on an, in a delivery process. That's not a job. But unfortunately, these, I don't know how many, millions maybe, of people that have been certified as a product owner, almost all of them have been certified by an agile coach that has never done product. Does anybody think there's something wrong with this picture? So it just propagates. On the other side, on the, on the, the side of light, we have the most valuable companies in the world. Otherwise, I think we would have drowned out a long time ago. So it is bizarre. You're all, we're all fortunate to be right here. Uh, in most of the world, you would, I mean, it's shocking. It really is. So you just asked like a big t question. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we got a Zoom question from Slide. We got 29 people upvoted this. So the top question from our friends on Zoom. Thank you, folks on Zoom. For those who had trouble with the 100 cap, sorry, glad you got in. How do you manage trade-offs between delivering immediate value and investing in foundational design that may not have immediate impact but crucial for long term? Well, I mean, that question is basically the essence of what uh, a product team does, especially the product manager, designer, and tech lead. They have to decide their work. Right? They have to decide. They're given a problem to solve, and their job is to solve that problem. But you know, this is the difference between a project team and a product team. If anybody's wondered, by the way, why tech debt has just gone crazy in so many companies, it's usually project team. Because one of the consequences is people are cranking out these projects. Nobody's worried about the answer to this question. Because like, why would they? They're not going to work on it. In fact, probably nobody's going to work on it. There is more orphan software in the project model than anything else. So, you know, it's just a machine for creating tech debt, which then, of course, slows everything. You all know the drill. So in a product team, they have to make these choices. First of all, you don't launch anything unless it's instrumented, unless it's maintainable, because you're the ones that have to take care of the customers. So this kind of gets to the basics of you know, how a real product team works. They're durable, they own an area, they take responsibility for it, they're measured by outcomes. So yeah, that's more like, 
very basic product question, and every, everybody in this room has had to deal with that. I was hoping you could remark on uh, two trends I've seen. One uh, where you've divided the product management function to an outbound product manager and an inbound product manager who works. Uh, I, was, I was the inbound product manager working with the engineering team. So that's one trend. <laughs> Uh, the other By one that trend is from literally 30 years ago. That is, uh, I'm laughing because I haven't heard that in decades. But that is, uh, yeah, that was now we call one product marketing and one called product management. But go ahead. What's your other trend? Oh, the other one was more on the recent kind of news from Airbnb that they eliminated the role of product management. Yeah. They're calling them product marketers. So wonder what that has to do with uh, the overall yeah. trend of the evolution that's of this role. A, that's a much more relevant thing. Uh, so, because, um, you know, when Brian Chesky did that, unfortunately, you know, the way that sort of came across, it was pretty ambiguous for a lot of people. And, um, and I did a whole series of articles on this, if people are interested, to try to explain what was really going on. Um, but let's say uh, he is basically taking over the product management. So, they didn't move product management to product marketing. They did two things. One is they instituted product marketing, or, or they had a little, I think, but they dialed it up, which is not a bad thing. We love product marketing. Did anybody see my partner Martina's book, Love? Yeah, so product marketing, super valuable. But he uh, decided to take on the product management himself. Now, um, I think I, I even publicly predicted what will probably happen. And to his credit, he said, you know, I, I'm pretty sure not everything I'm doing here is we're going to keep doing because it's sort of an experiment. But at that size, for him to take on it, uh, itself, now it's not unheard of it. Uh, like for example, Apple has a lot of those leaders that are like that. They do the product management. You know, it's not typical. There are some, uh, Apple's complicated because they have these three very different kinds of products. But uh, for a lot of their products, they don't have product managers. The product leaders do the product management. But they have amazing designers, amazing, uh, engineers and, of course, very good product marketing. So that's uh, one way for the leaders to take it. Um, and that's like Amazon does a lot of that, too. I mean, they have a lot of product managers, but their product leaders are really great product leaders. So product, you know, th this at the Airbnb scale, I don't think that's going to give him what he wants. And the bigger issue to me is not that he's taking the product management, but that he's turning it in to project based work. Very output driven. Uh, you know, I, who knows? The, you know, it's an experiment that he's doing. It's his company. He's certainly got that right. I don't think it's going to go well. Hi, Marty. Uh, yeah. Um, I, so very few products have changed the world. So in Apple, it's like the iPhone, the iPod, and internet, and now AI. But very few that we could probably name them all. So I'm curious as the product leader, um, how can we create more of those world changing products? Well, I, I do think you're setting the bar a little high there. <laughs> um, you know, change the world. Um, I, I fr try to frame things as, you know, really make users lives better. If you set the bar as you really want to improve the lives of our customers, I can think of hundreds of companies that do that. Even in, uh, in fact, somewhere I was just talking to somebody um, who I used to work, uh, one of the companies I used to advise do one of the least sexy products in the world. It's SEC regulatory software, B2B software, ju enterprise, just for public companies, just for the accountants. You can think of anything less sexy than that? I can never. It's a, but it's an amazing company called Workiva, which is, by the way, one of the top places to work. And uh, their vision is when they started, the accountants were miserable. Every month end, every quarter end, and especially every year end. They couldn't even get home in time to see their kids put them to bed. And they were like, this is ridiculous. We can automate all this. And by the way, this is a set of engineers that were the founders. They didn't know about accounting, but they knew they could automate this. And they did. And their whole focus was making the quality of their customers' lives better. And uh, at the, I was an, an investor and advisor. I just adore that company. They're public now. They're very successful. But every year, they, have, uh, um, they get all their product teams together 
in one place. And, um, and they invite customers just to come up and tell them their story. And honestly, the room's in tears because they are so genuinely happy. To me, that's what we're trying to do. Now, I love it. There are some companies doing cancer research. Fabulous, you know, that's awesome. There are, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, services, devices. Even you could argue, like somebody here works at Rivian. Um, I'm trying not to promote anything Elon Musk right now, so I won't say the, the other competitor, but Tesla, the, the uh, Rivians are amazing. Yeah, they really are amazing, and uh, yes, I think those are helping the world. But uh, So don't set an unrealistic, you know, I don't think you need to say if you're not doing an iPhone, you're not doing awesome work. But this is one of the things that challenges Google because I think a lot of people don't give Google the credit they deserve. And it's partly because they're a victim of their own success. AdWords is unheard of level of success. Everything else looks minor compared to it. What is it? They're up to eight services with over a billion users. Think about that. That's, that's amazing. It's just, and it would look amazing to anybody except somebody who did AdWords. <laughs> All right, we got one more from the Zoom folks from Slido. The second popular question was, you talk about Apple being a product-centric organization, but all product decisions come top down. The product teams are pretty much following top directions. There's, there's no question, it's just uh, a statement. Oh, it's so. a statement, yeah. I yeah. mean, there's a lot of misunderstanding about companies that happens all the time. People thought that was true with Steve Jobs, but it really wasn't at all. He was amazing at telling you everything that was wrong with his proto your prototype. And then his, he was like, I don't know, you go fix it. Uh, uh, Bezos, also famous for this, saying, you know, look, I can't tell you what to build. I can't, our customers can't tell you what to build. We don't know what's possible. Your job is to invent great solutions on our behalf. So is that top down? No, that's not top down. That is basically, like Steve Jobs was amazing at judging how consumers were gonna respond to products. Basically had an incredibly high bar and Johnny Ivey, incredibly high bar. And so if a product makes it by these people, it's pretty damn good. Worth pointing out, of all the companies I've ever been in, nobody does more prototypes than Apple. Now you have to realize, with hardware, if you screw up, it's a bigger screw up than with software. So they kind of need to do that, but they live that. And you know, it's all about doing that until you have something great. If anybody wants to learn more about, the, the trick with Apple is of course, they're, they're the most secretive company ever. I've been trying for years to be able to write about some of their product, best product leaders in the world, if you ask me. But I, they won't let me write about them. And you know, I'm, I'm literally trying to tell the world how great these people are, but their PR still says you can't write about yeah. them. But, there, there was a the book, there's finally a book, Ken Cosienda's well, book, right? I, I figured you were, yeah. There's a great book, and I don't, I, I'm guessing he just didn't ask permission. Yeah. <laughs> it's the only way they would have agreed. And it tells the sort of backstory of uh, discovery of the iPhone. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's called Creative Selection. Yep. Yep. And he realized he's not a product manager, he's coming from a tech lead perspective. Mm -hmm. But it's a wonderful story. And if any, you can't read that and think this was top down. This was very much right. about empowered teams giving them hard problems to solve and the teams coming up with amazing solutions. Cool, I'll, I'll put that in the chat for the Zoom folks. And then another one real quick. How do you navigate conflicts between stakeholders' demands for quick results and the time required for thorough user research and validation? Actually, I love that question. I'm just trying to think, how much time do we have? <laughs> That's a big topic. Sounds like a new book. Don't, okay. No, <laughs> but I, let me just say this, because this is something, I, and I was just telling my friend Jim, I, I need to write more about this, and I, I regret that I didn't include it in Inspired. It should have been in Inspired, this particular question, because um, let me just share this dynamic, just because I, I think it's so common. A product team, like they, they really want to be an empowered product team and, and the company decides to give that a chance. And the first thing the empowered product team wants to do is go out and do a bunch of research about what the problems really are. Think about that. So the, the company, probably the, the stakeholders, lots of, people, lots of leaders, they've been doing years talking to customers. They, they definitely have strong opinions about what the problems are. 
what they feel like they hired these teams to do is solve those problems. Yet the product team goes and says, no, so we got to do our own research. You might be wrong, might not be a problem. We're not even sure that's a real problem. We want to go do our own research and figure out. And I'm like, that's the worst thing you can do for yourself. First of all, they're probably right. It's probably a real problem. Now, you could quibble about if that's like the most important problem or the second most important problem. Don't fight that battle. Say, OK, we're going to go worse. That's the problem. Our job is to solve it. An empowered team means they get to figure out the best solution to that problem. In the off chance that it really isn't a problem, your very first prototype testing with users is going to figure that out. And then you could say, hey, we're running into some uh, surprises here. They're not interested in this solution. And maybe we have something going on here. That almost never happens. But realize from the CEO's perspective, they're like, yeah, we want to do this. And now they're telling me it's going to be two months to do all this user research. They're like, this sucks. You know, they're not interested in that at all. And at the end of it, they're just barely caught up to what the rest of the company already knows. And here's the part that's really bad. That nobody talks about this out loud. But the moment they give an empowered product team a problem to solve, the clock starts ticking. There's always a clock ticking. If you use two months up on user research, what are you going to have left before they're like, all right, enough playing around. You need to get this out. You need to get a solution. At this point, I don't care what it is. Just ship something. You got a week left to do a solution. This is a team that had good intentions, but totally messed up politically. If they would have just said, yeah, we're going to grant, we're going to say the leader might know what they're talking about. <laughs> and so we're going to assume that's a real problem. And we're going to focus on what we're really in the unique position to do, which is to come up with a solution. This is what products makes it so hard. Our job, they don't buy the problem, they buy our solution. And if our solution isn't demonstrably better than the alternatives, they won't buy us. So product teams need to focus on solutions, Pro solution discovery. Problem discovery, you will run into great opportunities, save them for the next iteration of the product strategy. But pick your battles, is what I'm really saying. The battle you want to pick is to be able to do the solution discovery. If that means you have to agree to work on a problem that you might not think is the most important one in front of the company, save that until you prove that you can deliver real outcomes. Does that make sense? That's maybe more than you were asking for, but that is a big topic. And I, I know that we need to talk more about this because I see a lot of teams get in trouble with this. Yes. Quick question. Um, you talked about delivering outcomes um, in the beginning of the uh, presentation. Yes. If you sort of boil it down at, a, at any level, the business outcome becomes about top line revenue or sort of like bottom line revenue. Is that what you are sort of alluding to or you sort of break that down into different KPIs? Delivering something faster, oh, yeah. delivering something secure? Like how, how do you? Oh no, sure. I mean, there's, the truth is at an early stage startup, there's usually only one thing we care about, which is product market fit. Once we get product market fit, things get a lot more interesting. Like we could look at growth, we could look at retention, we could look at onboarding time. But the point is none of these are features that are getting shipped, they're all problems that are being solved. They might be our customer's problem, or they might be our problem, our company, or sometimes both, but they're like that. So early on, honestly, a lot of the growth stage companies I advise, retention is huge. And of course, retention is, uh, one of the challenges with retention is sort of the ultimate lagging indicator. So we're looking for what, what's called proxy KPIs to make sure we're making good progress now on these things. We don't want to wait a year until people renew, stuff like that. But those are real outcomes. But the point is, shipping a feature is not an outcome. That's just output. Solving a problem. I mean, one I was literally on a call with recently was the time it takes to onboard a new customer was taken way too long. They didn't, the, the leaders of the company didn't really care how that was solved <laughs> at all. They just knew it needed to be solved. It is non-scalable to take two months for them to get a customer from when they paid alive. That's not okay. So that's an outcome, right? Get that down, I mean, realistically, for a SaaS company to a day or two. That makes sense? 
Yeah, so one comment on uh, the model, product model that you have in a stakeholder funded tech setup. What happens is uh, stakeholder funded, st funded stakeholder funded technology organization, meaning feature model. Okay. In a feature model, what happens is uh, if you go to your stakeholders and leaders and say that, okay, I'm gonna run this in a pilot mode. What we what happens normally is there's a lack of trust because of which this pilot doesn't move forward in a in a speed that a product manager would want to. A lot so, of times because they're making the mistake I was just describing, but yeah, yes. Yeah, so what logistically should happen so that this pilot gets started? Good. And then how to scale this pilot across the Good. organization? I mean, the short answer is read the book <laughs> because that's exactly what it talks about is the techniques to do exactly this. Um, but also you're kind of raising a little bit uh, of politics that I want to make sure we talk about. Because you remember I was saying before a few times how it's so important to win over hearts and minds. This is kind of what, because we're talking about a relationship with stakeholders. Now, again, it's really important to understand the dynamics here. In the old model, the stakeholders are in the driver's seat, right? They like decide what's getting done. Now we're going and saying, you know, I think we can do better than that. It's gonna be different. And yes, you're right. It does mean you're not in the driver's seat. What you want to be clear on, though, is it doesn't mean we're in the driver's seat either. We're doing this together. Nobody does this better, by the way, than Christian. He's, got, he's mastered this because he is so good at getting those stakeholders to feel as a true partner with the product teams. I mean, he goes way out of his way to do this. Uh, and it works because they are part of that team. It's a very different thing to go to a stakeholder and say, let go, let the product team do their thing versus work with the product team. Because the purpose, we, you know, we say this over and over, great product is something your customers love, but works for the business. We can't do the works for the business without your help. If, you, if they feel like you get this, you mean it, not lip service, but you mean it, it's a, that's the kind of hearts and minds you wanna do. Now, of course, once you've shown you can do this well, and they're not worried, that you're gonna come up with something that does not work for them, you'd be surprised how much room they give you. So that's what I meant by earning that trust level by level. These are some good questions. Well, yeah. I got a question over here. Yeah. Um, so a lot of us are probably prepping for Q2 planning right now. <laughs> um, the previous question started to get what I was gonna ask you, which is um, being tactical, what can we do next quarter to start implementing some of this. And maybe the, the spin from my perspective is um, a strong engineering led organization uh, and maybe tackling the, how do we decide what we build? Um, yeah. So. Well, just so you know. Thanks. Engineering led is to product model is the easiest one. Every other one is a lot harder because the hardest thing in most companies is to get them to actually pay attention to engineering. And that's not your situation. Because they, you know, a lot of these companies that we're talking about, they outsource engineering. The ultimate opposite of engineering, right? Which of course you would not outsource your engineering in what we're talking about. I should have said that out, you know, explicitly, but I want to be very clear on that. So um, anyway, that is a lot easier. I would suggest you'll see this in the book, pilot teams. This is what it's for. Start small. Uh, Make sure, I mean, you can read about them, but I want to emphasize something. Make sure that whoever you pick to be on that pilot team, make sure they have the skills. So who either you've hired people into your company that know how to work this way, and they can be on this pilot team, or you have a manager that's coached them to do this, or you've brought in, like Jim's a product coach, um, bring in somebody like Jim to help them him show the people how to work this way. Well, one of the th worst things you can do, and I see this a lot, is that you staff a pilot team and the people don't know what they're doing. I mean, it's just a recipe for failure. So you've, you have to make sure that people have these skills and then you show the organization gently. I mean, pilot teams are just a gentle deployment mechanism, right? It's like an A-B test in a company. Mm -hmm. yeah. My name is Aman. I'm a product manager at Google. 
And I'm a big believer in structuring the right incentives. And you know the saying, show me the incentives, I'll show you the results. Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering from your experience working with Trainline um, or looking at examples of gym pass, what are some of the ways these companies structured the incentives for product managers or for um, product leaders so that they were able to achieve the outcome that most um, teams and companies don't. So just to be clear, because you know, when you say incentives, do you literally mean compensation? I, I think that's one way that most people focus on. But if there was anything else. Well, because you can have incentives like what are our OKRs and things like that. But I, if you mean financial incentives, like bonuses, that's a really special case, and I, we should talk about it. Is that what you want to talk about? Kind of, uh, that, because that's, I mean, financial incentives drives a lot of... But they're different. You see what I mean? One is, okay, our team is here to reduce the onboarding time. That's our goal, is to reduce the onboarding time. And then if you do that as a team, well, do you get some extra money? Is that, that's the financial incentive one. So, so, so let me ask you this. How do you structure incentives in a way that teams are working more as product-based um, model as opposed to feature-based model. All right. I'm going to assume, because we can talk privately, so I make sure, in case I'm misinterpreting, I'm going to assume you're really talking about incentive compensation. That's not normally different feature team to, to empower product team. Uh, if you are referring to just outcomes, then it's basically OKRs is what we use. For a, but the difference is OKRs for a team, never for an individual. And I know that some, even Google has made the mistake of going to more uh, individual OKRs. I think that's a mistake. Uh, it's more of a distraction. That's all. What you want to make sure that everybody on the team has the same set of OKRs, or usually one or two. That's critical. Assuming you meant real incentive, financial incentives, this is the big thing you want to realize. You, and this is totally different in sales. We are not sales. Sales is a very different game. And the incentive is, a, I think, I'm not challenging how sales does incentive programs. That's the worst thing you can do for product. Because you want to incent every product team to help every other product team. If you set it up like it's like, oh, I'm competing against Dan. I'm a PM, he's a PM. If I do better, I get more. That's the worst thing. Because in the product world, we almost never have full autonomy over our own stuff completely, right? We depend on everybody else. I don't win. We want to set it up so that I don't win unless Dan also wins. And that's why we like equity. Equity is a really good way, stock options, is a really good way of doing this. It means that we all have skin in the game, and I am very motivated to help Dan because there's no way the stock is going to go up just for me and not for Dan, right? So we want to make sure, and I think that is one of the things that Silicon Valley got right, is that it's not perfect. And in lots of the world, you can't really do it because government rules and tax rules and stuff. And so they look at sort of plan B, which is usually around profit sharing of some sort. But the principle is to make sure nobody wins unless we all win. Does that make sense? All right. Hey, Marty. As based on training from you, as I mentioned, at Google, I kind of helped an organization, about 2,000 people, to transform from absolute delivery to empowered product. That was really hard, but amazing. Um, so like, I kind of, I can't wait to read the book and see what mistakes I made <laughs> and like, you know, what I got, right? But like, what do you see is next, especially now that the change uh, you know, how generative AI is changing these roles, how is it making it easier or harder, or do you see any impact? And could you talk a little bit about what you see it does to the industry? None of these are easy questions, really. Well, a couple of them were not so bad. This is a big one. So yeah, let's talk about um, generative AI, because of course we should. we should, even though of course still super early. I am, I have, uh, I'll be very honest, and I have written, if you're interested, like I wrote something called Future of Product Teams and how it changes, generative AI changes the shape of product teams. And I tried to share very openly what I'm really excited about and what I'm also very nervous about. 
because there's both sides to this coin. There on the upside, the chance of it dramatically improving the shape of product teams in particular, you know, one of the things that every product team complains about is that they depend on too many other teams. Right? I mean, isn't that one of the biggest headache we deal with? Initiatives have all these dependencies and there's so low autonomy. Even if you have perfect empowerment, you don't have 100% autonomy because you depend on platform teams, you depend on other teams. And, and so it's like, yeah, I deal with a lot of these dependencies. This has the real opportunity to give teams much broader, you know, if you're interested in it, one of the most important and complex topics in product is team topologies. And you, we have the chance of making uh, the most significant improvements to team topology we've ever been able to do. Uh, and uh, this idea of cognitive load, thank you, cognitive load. Uh, you know, gener look, we've, uh, tools like Copilot are amazing for helping with this. And the chance of what we could do with these teams is wonderful. One of the things, uh, and honestly, I'm, I'm really feeling pretty good about the impact on engineers and also on designers. The one I'm most nervous about from the first sort of six to 12 months of experimentation is product managers. Because product managers, let me put it this way, the most important thing I coach product managers on is how to think. And generative AI is probably the biggest <coughs> adversary in trying to get product managers to think. I'm seeing that, in fact, I reversed my early um, you know, recommendations because I say like, why wouldn't you start with ChatGP? Get something reasonable and then improve it. The problem is people were bringing me just the results of ChatGPT and I'm like, this is horrible. <laughs> and I was like, no, you need to think. So now my recommendation is you think about it and then use ChatGPT to kind of challenge yourself and maybe find holes or make it better. So, uh, and you know, you've seen that play out with everything from backlog administration to product strategy. So there is a great potential there. And I will also say, and this is another reason why I was saying, I don't think there's much of a future. Again, now, you take this with a grain of salt. This might take a year to happen or it might take 10 years to happen. I don't know. But if you're a, ba a product owner, good luck. I mean, uh, do you see much future with that? That is one of the easiest things, to, and they're already tools I've been playing with, prototypes that people are showing me to automate what a product owner does. So I don't think there's a big future on that one. For a feature team project manager, a lot of project management is task management, and tools are going to be much better at that probably than we are. So I don't think there's much future there. But I do think if you think about what's, what's really the essence of product, it's value and viability. And that's what we're needed for. So I am encouraging everybody to raise their game to what we're talking about, value and viability. And then, uh, so, you know, generative AI can help with that. Or if, you know, the people have this habit of following the path of least resistance and not thinking. It's just human, it's humans. And so, um, don't let the tools take you down that path. I was just wondering if you could comment on how the reduction in workforce that's going on everywhere, you know, it's putting pressure on product teams and how to be resilient against that and survive Well, that's it. really what's motivating my recent, uh, you know, dialing up the volume on, look, you don't want to be vulnerable. You don't want to be. This, now, one of the things going on, don't forget, is the cost of funds. Because at the same time, it's like a perfect storm of all these things. Having the cost of funds go up and generative AI come in at the same time, that is a minimum a formula for uh, you know, CEOs and CFOs of being scared. And so at the minimum. And, um, and I think they're not only, you know, there's layoffs, but then there's other companies that are just holding on to see if they're going to open up jobs or not. So I think all that's going on. The, the, my, my advice is, is to uh, make yourself as valuable to your, for your career, you know, your own career, but for your company, for your customers as possible. Because those people are always like, 
the most valuable people in a company. So I, I would encourage you to do that, and I'm, I think that's what we're talking about. Remember, a feature team can do everything a delivery team could do and more. An empowered product team can do everything a feature team can do and more. So you're only building your muscles to do the kinds of things we're talking about here. And most of the time, even if your leaders don't know any of this stuff or don't care, your designer and your engineers do. And usually, the, you know, together you can say, let's like show what we can do. And also, I didn't talk, since I mentioned some of the sort of political things, another great lesson is amazing what you can do with a prototype in terms of winning hearts and minds and support. Uh, one of the best things to product teams in the world has been Figma, only because it continues to improve how quickly we can show these amazing things. They don't even have, it's not, they don't need to work. They just need to show people, oh, that's what you meant. Can we really do that? And, you know, they turn to the engineers, can we really do that? And they're like, yes, we can do that. And, you know, they're like, that's so different than when you go with a PowerPoint to some executive and saying, you should fund this. And they're like, the, what they're thinking is, we, I see 100 of these a day. I see nothing different. It's just a bunch of promises. Sh do a prototype. Let the prototype do your talking. It's amazing what that does. Hi, um, kind of jumping off from that point, um, when you're looking at companies who have successfully transformed and, and you're looking at how the C-suite kind of, you know, uh, bought in and, and moved over, um, particularly with the, the, you know, the high interest rates, um, how do you talk about moving from, say, you know, delivery model CapEx focus to allowing some OpEx investment in the research, in the innovation, in building prototypes and so on, because I think that that is also kind of a factor uh, that goes along with like speed and the upcoming earnings calls and you know, making that transition. How do you help sell that idea to them so they can be um, I'm with you, totally with you. By the way, this is a really common one. Almost every CFO raises this, uh, which is why if you turn to the chapters in the back of the book, called Objections, there is a whole chapter on objections from the CFO, and that explicit question is right there. And that's a really important one. Most important thing to take away is that discovery is not R&D. Discovery is product development. And that's the sort of main, you know, your CFO will, will like that. <laughs> now, you may need to do real R&D, like say you're doing uh, a model training and it's years away, that's probably real R&D. But for most, both, it, where companies get in trouble is when they treat discovery like R&D versus, uh, or like research purely, and not like uh, product development. But anyway, take a look at that. Marty, you're a coach to people. Um, so you're, I imagine you're often talking to teams and trying to figure out, or founders like, maybe they say a good game, are they really working on the product operating model or not? Um, I imagine a lot of people here might be looking for jobs. How can they, and how do you quickly figure out, like, is this group, is this person, and that special 10 to 20% that's really doing the product operating model or, or yeah. not? The good news is it's easy to figure this out in an interview. Um, is, you know, that's, first of all, just, I mean, you don't even have to buy the book. We just gave it to you. So the principles right there is easy to see that. And, you know, you don't ever want to go to an interview and like, are you using this? Or, you, you know, you don't want to be that person. But you can very easily see this. Um, so, and, you know, you could ask for, like, how does things work? Tell me how's it, you know, do you get a roadmap? What does the roadmap look like? Uh, how does, the, where do the dates come from? You know, there's so many symptoms. So the thing about a feature team and a product team is there are not subtle differences. Right, there are big differences. You will see that. The bigger thing that you want to do, once you do that, is you want to really do some research on who your manager will be. Because that really is the most important thing. Because a lot of companies, by the way, the reason they're hiring you is to help them move and get better. And that's great. If your manager has been there, done that, and is willing to help you, that's the most important thing. There are certain companies that have a reputation 
for helping to develop people like this. Google has a well-earned reputation for that. You know, it always depends on your particular manager, but I, there's a lot of people that I have sent to Google because I wanted to introduce them to a specific manager that can make these people great. Uh, they're not the only company like that. You might notice it's not, uh, um, a lot of the executives, Apple, Google, Netflix, Amazon, they all talk about how important coaching is. Microsoft, it's one of the principles. And so um, that's, what you, that's the advantage of companies that already understand that. But even if it's not one of those companies, if the person you're you know, looking to work for, let's say they just came out of Stripe for five years, it's like, okay, that's probably a pretty good thing. And then when you sit down with that person, you say, you know, truth is, I'm really interested in this company, but I really like the idea of working for you. And I've seen what you've done before, and I want to know, could you help me become awesome? First of all, most managers, that's exactly what they want to hear. <laughs> but uh, the, that's, sometimes they're like, I don't have time. It's a startup. I need people who already know this stuff. But most of them are like, look, if you put in the work, I will help you. That's, what, that's the most important thing. Uh, I got one question. Inspired to talk about, obviously, empowered product teams, and you talked about co-location, right? <laughs> I was um, wondering when that was going yeah, to come up. Uh, we're we're global. We have like five different, we have three different development locations, right? And if we, if we, all our teams are local, they they start to be disconnected at some point, right? So sometimes you want the follow the clock model. So what what has your stance changed on the product team has to be co-located, especially with COVID? And then right. are there more advanced thoughts now about distributed teams? No, I'm totally with you. Um, and there's no question, yeah, I mean, it's no secret, right? You look at Inspired, it says, because remember, the sharing the practices of the best teams, there's no question, especially when that book was written, that co-located teams were outperforming. And the sad truth is that now we know for a fact that's true. <laughs> However, it's not an option in most companies. Now, this, I will say, because I can't resist, in your scenario where you have people around the world, if you are able to have co-located teams in different cities around the world, that's our favorite. Because the main reason I say we're never going to go back is because we, we, can't, we don't have the talent in any one place. We need, more than anything, access to talent. And though that talent is everywhere on the planet. I mean, I th actually think that's a wonderful thing for the world. But... That's not going away, even if you wanted to. There's just not, look at the traffic already back. You know, it's just, it's not gonna happen here. So we are dealing with a world where talent is distributed. So now the question is, because the sad part is, and I, I'm not gonna lie to anybody here, I, almost all the companies I advise are remote. It is so much slower and so much less innovation. I mean, anybody, that's just the truth, I don't care. You know, I know some people like to argue that, but you know, I don't wish this was the case. And it's not the case for delivery, by the way. It's only really Discover we were talking about. But that real collaboration, you know, Steve Jobs talked about it as the necessary friction. Show me that happening on Zoom. Show me that happening on Slack. It doesn't. People don't want to do that. And so the result is a lot of things go way slower. You still get stuff done, but it is slow. And I, I think I was talking to Christina before about how the older I get, the less patient I am. And I was like, oh my God, I, it really takes this long. We talked about this two weeks ago. It normally would have been something would have been done in a couple hours and they're still dragging on this. And I mean, it's just slow. And, uh, you know, I think what happens in terms of innovation is people avoid the conflict. Because when you're remote, conflict is very different. The whole psychological safety thing starts to blow up really quickly. So they avoid it. Uh, or worse, they build resentments. And that's happening a lot. So um, this isn't great. And the truth is, I'm there, I think I have one more book left in me, <laughs> which is the third edition of Inspired. And I have like six things I really want to, you know, change in the third next edition. But I've been holding because I need better answer on this. We need better tools and techniques to get at least to the level we were at before. Uh, I, and, and honestly, I work with some great companies that work on tools. The tools are not there. 
This is a very hard research problem right now. How do you get the kind of collaboration? Because we're not talking communication. We have 100 communication tools today. What we're talking about is this kind of you know, magic that happens with friction that uh, when it's people that really respect each other and very different skill sets coming together on a hard problem, that's hard to replicate. A plane, absolutely, travel. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, uh, and in fact, starting people out with, in fact, I've been talking, my coaching to managers is you go travel to your people. You know, go travel to them and spend real time with them. You're going to do your coaching instead of once a week. You know, you're going to do it in a burst, like for a few days every quarter. But you need this. This is a super hard problem. To me, this is, and by the way, that's another one of those big macro issues that are going on. Because you, you see a lot of the executives are like, all we know is we got to get back to co-location. And they're fighting it because you can't give a benefit like remote work and then take it away and expect people not to be really pissed at you. <laughs> so I, um, this is a really tough situation. Yeah, that's some big ones going on, right? Big, big changes. That's probably a... a those, are, those were great topics. I enjoyed. I hope this was useful for everybody. I realize we're like 9 o'clock. Yeah. Uh.